Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. After hundreds of years, the perfect pastor has been found. He packs a 45-minute message into exactly 20 minutes, and then he sits down. He condemns sin, but he never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 in the morning to midnight and also serves as the church janitor. He makes $400 per week and donates $300 a week to the church. He always stands ready to contribute to every other good cause and also generously helps panhandlers who drop by the church. He's 36 years old and he's been preaching for 40 years. He's tall on the short side, heavy set in a thin sort of way. He has eyes of blue or brown to fit the occasion. He wears his hair parted in the middle, left side dark and straight, right side brown and wavy. He has a burning desire to work with the youth and spends all his time with the senior citizens. He smiles all the time while keeping a straight face because he has a keen sense of humor that finds him seriously dedicated. He makes 15 calls a day on church members, spends all his time evangelizing the lost, and is always found in his study if he is needed. Unfortunately, he burnt himself out and died at the age of 32. You're sure to be disappointed if you're looking for perfect leaders because there are no perfect pastors or spiritual leaders. Perfection is not the standard to measure against for anyone in the church, but rather spiritual growth, Christ-likeness, and godliness. In the context of the Lord's coming for the church at the rapture, in the seven-year tribulation which follows it, Paul is teaching of the church's need to be a light toward those in darkness to be a light to those in danger of being left behind. Paul turns to speak about spiritual leadership here and of the church's responsibility towards its leaders and towards each other. As the church is in good order, with strong leadership, caring for one another, at peace with one another, it can be that bright light for the gospel of grace that God desires. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12 reads, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. Paul begins with, We beseech you, brethren. Paul begs and urges a course of action by the Thessalonians. When you see this in Paul's letters, it reminds you of the grace that is to motivate our behavior today. Writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and with Christ's authority, Paul could have commanded the Thessalonians. But grace urges and begs. It reaches for the heart to do what is right and good in the sight of God. And Paul urges his brethren here. Paul saw the local church as a family. His favorite name for believers in his epistles is brethren. In this closing section, Paul discusses essentials for a happy, thriving church family. And without leadership, a family falls apart. And without leadership, a church family falls apart. The love, guidance, example, and leadership of a father and mother are crucial and vital to a home. And it's the same with pastors, elders, and deacons in the church. God has ordained leadership for the local church for its proper order and function. The church is made up of different people who have been called to different responsibilities. Christ, the head of the church, the body of Christ, by His will, gives spiritual gifts to His church, and He places people in His body as it pleases Him. And He has called and placed some in positions of authority and leadership in His church. Paul refers here, here to the church's responsibilities and attitude towards its spiritual leaders. And the church is begged and urged to know them which labor among you. Now it's clearly the responsibility of leaders to know their church and each person individually, young and old and everyone in between. But we see here 
that it's also the responsibility of the church to know their leaders. The word know does not mean to merely know who they are or just to know their name or what their favorite sports team is. It entails a personal knowledge. It means to see, know, and understand what they do, who they are, and to know them personally. A woman had twins and gave them up for adoption. One of them went to a family in Egypt and was named Amal. The other went to a family in Spain and they named him Juan. Years later, Juan sent a picture of himself to his mom. Upon receiving the picture, she told her husband how she wished she also had a picture of Amal. Her husband responded, but dear, there are twins. If you've seen Juan, you've seen them all. You may think with spiritual leaders that if you've seen one, you've seen them all. But all, the, but all spiritual leaders are not the same. While they may have similar responsibilities, they are each different. And the church is called to know and appreciate their leaders individually. Because often the more you know a person, the more you care about them. The connotation here in believers not being indifferent toward their leaders is that in knowing them, it will lead to greater respect, appreciation, care, and oneness in the church. In the instruction to the church to know and esteem their leaders, Paul is also teaching the leaders what is expected out of them. Paul wrote that the church is to know them that labor among you. Leaders are to be laborers and hard workers. The word labor means to work to the point of sweat and exhaustion, to work until weariness. The same word is used in Luke 5.5 5 when Peter said, Master, we have toiled or worked hard all the night and have caught nothing. The church leader is to be one who gives it their all, who works hard for the Lord. Out of their love for the church, they work and they make themselves available to the body of Christ. Leaders are to lead by example. Leadership is about influence. The greatest influence in the home and family by a father and mother is not so much by their words, but by their example. And likewise, leaders in the church family need to lead with a Christ-like example by their own personal growth, by their own sacrifice and service, by their own hard work. And as the church sees and knows their labors, this will lead the church to do the same. They will follow that example of hard work, which the church needs in order to get things done for advancing the gospel and caring for the church. Notice how Paul puts it, though, that spiritual leaders who labor among us and that they, they are over us in the Lord. A leader is to be both among and over at the same time. Unfortunately, extremes often come into play with this in the church. Some churches only want their leaders to be among them or to be their buddy. Many leaders do this, but this weakens their authority and impact for Christ. On the other hand, some leaders emphasize being over the church. They want people to look to them, and they often become lifted up with pride and selfishness, and they lead the church like a dictator. They tell people that they can only listen to them and look to no one else. There needs to be a balance. Spiritual leadership is about both being among and over God's people, but always pointing everyone to the Lord who we all follow. All this is done in love, wanting only what's best for the church spiritually. Paul teaches the church to know them that are over you in the Lord. Being over you does not mean that the spiritual leader is to boss people around with an attitude of superiority. If they do, there's a spiritual problem. Scripture warns against this too. 1 Peter 5, 1 to 3 says, the elders who are among you I exhort Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 1.24, Not that we have dominion over your faith, but are fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. 
Being over the church does not mean a leader has the right to rule and reign over the faith and spiritual walk of their flock. Leaders are called to point people not to themselves, but to Christ and to God's word, encouraging each person to be a Berean and to not take their word for it, but to receive the word with readiness of mind and to study the scriptures for themselves to see if those things be so. Over you in the Greek means to stand before. Spiritual leaders are to stand before the church in the sense of being out front, leading it, understanding that they have a God-given responsibility to provide direction for God's people according to the Word of God. Church leaders are to be servant leaders under the Lord's authority, leading with His selfless mind, with His heart, strength, by His grace, humility, and sacrifice. Acts 20, verse 28 reads, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Often there's a negative viewpoint of God's people. There's uh, old cliches like, if it wasn't for people, ministry would be easy. Or there's the old one, to dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. To dwell below with saints we know, well, that's another story. But as leaders lead in the church, they're overseeing and directing people that Christ purchased with his own blood. Christ died for each one of them. That is to change the entire perspective of a leader. The church is of infinite worth and value in the eyes of Christ, dearly loved and treasured by Him. And so pastors should lead them with deep carefulness and love in light of how precious they are to Christ. Spiritual leaders also stand before the church to cast the vision, to inspire and influence the church for Christ. One stormy, stormy night, a boat could make no headway and while the captain was struggling to get into port, a nervous passenger said to him, Do you think we shall get in all right? And he replied, This is a leaky old boat, and we may go down. And the boilers are not in very good condition, so we may go up. But whatever happens, we are going on. Leaders are to stand before the church and influenced by their dogged determination and steadfastness to move the church forward no matter what happens in this world. Paul says the church is to know them that admonish you. Pastors and leaders admonish believers. Admonish means to put in mind. It is the offering of counsel and wisdom by the instruction of God's word, putting God's thoughts, God's heart, God's will in the minds of the church. And it takes time and consistent instruction of the word for the church to grow spiritually. In the publication British Weekly, one time a letter was published about the preaching ministry, ministry of pastors. It said, Dear Sir, it seems ministers feel their sermons are very important and spend a great deal of time preparing them. I have been attending church quite regularly for 30 years, and I have probably heard 3,000 of them. To my consternation, I discovered I can't remember a single sermon. I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitably spent on something else. For weeks, a storm of editorial responses ensued, ending with the following letter. Dear Sir, I have been married for 30 years. During that time, I have eaten 32,850 meals, mostly my wife's cooking. Suddenly, I have discovered I cannot remember the menu of a single meal, and yet I have the distinct impression that without those meals, I would have starved to death a long time ago. Just like the regular need for our daily food, God's people need this regular intake of spiritual food, spiritual nourishment, by the teaching and preaching of God's Word, by spiritual leaders, and by our, each of our own personal study. It is God's will that spiritual leaders regularly admonish or put God's word in the mind of his church so that, they, that, so that they don't starve spiritually and so that they grow up into Christ in all things. 
We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. In this booklet, we learned that every time we find the word church, it does not always mean the same thing, and it doesn't always refer to the same group of people. For our lives to be transformed by grace, we must read, study, learn, grow, and apply God's grace instruction for His church under grace, found in the letters of Paul. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. 1 Thessalonians 5.13 reads, And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Paul doesn't say to crown your pastors and elders as kings, but to esteem them. Esteeming leaders does not mean to place them on a pedestal or to esteem them to the point that you blind yourself to their faults. But it also doesn't mean to hold back encouragement in an effort to keep them humble, which is also done. Esteeming just means that their labor in the Word and in the church should be appreciated and respected by those who benefit from their labors and ministry to the church. Esteeming spiritual leaders is about honoring and respecting their calling in the Lord. It's holding them in high regard for their work's sake and caring for the souls of God's people, overseeing the Lord's church, and protecting and proclaiming God's truth. And because of the sometimes difficult nature of the church leader's work, those under their leadership are to esteem them very highly. Spiritual leadership is a great responsibility, and it comes with its own unique burdens and battles and struggles and hard decisions. The old baseball manager Casey Stengel once said, The key to being a good leader is keeping the people who hate me away from those who are still undecided. Recognizing their own battles and their own struggles, the church is taught to esteem, appreciate, and respect pastors and leaders in the Lord. Spiritual leaders need prayer. They need you to work alongside them. They need you to encourage them. And you esteem leaders in these ways. Paul says to esteem spiritual leaders very highly, to hold them in the highest regard, and to do this in love for their work's sake, by God's selfless, humble, and kind love. We are to esteem spiritual leaders. Families have squabbles, and so do church families. But God's will is that we do whatever it takes to live in peace with each other. John Winthrop, the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and leader of the party that arrived in Salem Harbor in 1630, delivered a sermon to the passengers before they disembarked to found the city of Boston. He knew that these pioneers needed to be at peace with each other if they were to accomplish their purposes. He said, we must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, and rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and common work, our community as members of the same body. For we must consider that the eyes of all people are on us. And the eyes of all people are on the church. When the world sees the church at war and not at peace, it wants nothing to do with the gospel. So the responsibility of the church is to maintain harmony by love and respect for its leaders and for its leaders to have love and respect for those they lead. Because when Christ's body is at peace, it is a brighter light for Christ and the gospel of grace can go out by the church with power. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 read, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, 
See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Notice in verse 14 that Paul turns to the church to do the things listed in verses 14 and 15. We often think that these are the kind of things that a pastor does and what the pastor's hired to do. But actually, these are things for the whole church to do for one another. Leaders included, but not the leaders only. These actions are expected from each of us in the church. Notice again that he uses the word brethren to indicate that by Paul speaking to the entire church family. Paul exhorts the church to do four things for four different groups of people. First, we are to warn the unruly. The word warn is the same word translated admonish in verse 12. So we're to put the word of God in the mind of those who are unruly. Unruly speaks of one who is careless, undisciplined, out of line. It speaks of a soldier who would not keep rank, who was out of step, who insisted on marching their own way. There are rules and standards to abide by within the word of God. An unruly believer is one who steps out of rank, who's out of step with God's word and its rules and standards. So if one in the church begins to go their own way, to be out of step with God's word by careless or undisciplined behavior, who's following a path that could end in serious consequences, it's the duty of the whole church to lovingly warn and counsel them by the word of God. Paul says the church is to comfort the feeble-minded. The feeble-minded are people that struggle under the weight of life's problems and difficulties. They are the ones who have lost heart, who have been beaten down by life. People like this are downcast, despondent, and discouraged. They have many worries and fears. They're drained, feeble emotionally, and are faint-hearted. You often find them in the church which is a tribute to the church and to its love. There are feeble-minded in the church because it is there that they find a place in this world where they can find the sympathy, love, strength, and the consideration that they need. Encourage, comfort them, Paul says. This takes place by an affirming word, a gentle touch, a smile, a shoulder to lean on, a listening ear, sharing a Bible verse. It may be simply your presence that comforts and lifts them. They just need to know that someone cares. The church is also to support the weak. The word support means to prop something up that's about to collapse. Support the weak gives the image of one who is too weak to stand up on their own. So others come along to bear them up so they don't fall. Weak people are the exhausted burnt out, ready to collapse, who don't have the strength to handle their daily loads and burdens. They may be weak spiritually, emotionally, or physically, but Paul tells the church to help them, be a support, be there for the weak so they know that there are others who are with them who will not leave them, that will hold them up. And Paul says, be patient toward all men. Patience is a quality and an attitude to be woven into each of these instructions. There needs to be patience with spiritual leaders, with the unruly, with the feeble-minded, and with weak believers. It speaks of not getting upset or discouraged or losing heart when others stumble, when they are not what we think they should be, or they're slow to respond or fail to change or grow as quickly as we'd like. When we're patient, we're calm, our fuse is long, our irritability is slow and we give ourselves and others time and space to grow. Practicing patience in the church is about realizing that all believers are in a process, that we all have strengths and weaknesses, that we're all at different levels of spiritual maturity. God is patient with us as we grow, and so we are to be patient with one another in the church. And the word all speaks of those outside the church as well. It reminds us that we are to practice patience with the lost as well as we share the gospel with them, realizing that it's a spiritual issue when people don't respond to the gospel, that it often takes numerous times for people to hear the gospel. 
and that we just need to be patient when we share the truth. In verse 15, all believers are instructed to not render evil for evil. Two rough and tough looking motorcycle bikers were eating in a truck stop when they spotted a rather small truck driver sitting alone and they went over and they began to pick on him. Since the guy was ignoring their verbal taunts, one of the bikers walked up to the man's table and dumped his food on the floor. The man said nothing, just quietly got up, paid his bill and left. The biker said to the waitress, he sure wasn't much of a man. She paused, looked out the window and said, yeah, he isn't much of a driver either. He just ran his rig over two motorcycles in the parking lot on his way out. The world says revenge is sweet. God's word teaches us to not render evil for evil. Paul tells the church to refuse to retaliate. If someone in the church or outside the church hurts you by word or action, though the natural reaction is to strike back, we're taught to be patient toward all men and not seek revenge, not pay back wrong for wrong, evil for evil, harsh word for harsh word, or unkind action for unkind action. The antidote for revenge and retaliation is to ever follow that which is good. Pursuing what is good is God's basic instruction to overcome what is evil. God wants his church to follow or pursue after what is good and right, treating others with goodness and righteousness and kindness. God is concerned about our reactions. He wants us to react with patience, to not render evil for evil, and to do what is good. And the word ever but we're always as emphatic, ever follow that which is good. Because our tendency is often to look for a loophole or a justification for why we shouldn't be kind to someone and why we should retaliate. But God tells us to always pursue showing goodness, grace, and kindness to each other in the church and everyone else. All this makes for the peace that God commands in verse 13. And obeying all the instruction in verses 12 to 15 will lead to the church becoming a strong witness for Christ to a watching world who watch to see if what we believe is really real and if it truly changes lives. And we know that it does. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society. P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.